Good evening members and guests and welcome to our Get Set for Retirement webinar tonight. My name is Kate Farrah, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the newly merged fund which is now made up of Energy Super and LGI Super. With me tonight I'm delighted to have John Malkay, our Advice Manager, Troy Rick, our Chief Investment Officer and Kevin Wan Lum, our Deputy Chief Investment Officer. I'd like to start tonight's webinar by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I want to take a moment this evening to congratulate everyone in Queensland on how we've handled the recent COVID-19 lockdowns. From Brisbane to the Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, Cairns and Yarrabah, thanks to everyone for knuckling down, wearing your masks, social distancing and for continuing to do the right thing. Let's keep doing what we're doing and hopefully we can slowly return to normality over the coming weeks and months. The recent lockdowns may have postponed the fund's face-to-face -face seminars and activities in regional areas, but we're busily making plans to get back out there to see members again as soon as possible. Tonight, we'll be covering some of the key considerations for putting together a plan that will help you achieve your best possible retirement. During the first segment, John will take you through how much you need to retire comfortably. Then, Troy and Kevin will deliver an investment and market update. John will then cover off on how to build wealth, as well as understanding the age pension and how to get the help that you need to build a retirement plan. We expect the presentation will run for about 50 minutes and at the conclusion there will be an interactive Q&A session. So we really love your questions. At any point throughout the webinar you can lodge a question by clicking the blue hand on the top left of the screen. We'll address as many questions as we can but rest assured if we don't get to your question tonight We'll contact you in coming days to provide you with an answer. Before I hand you over to John, I'd like to discuss the direction of the newly merged fund and provide an update on our acquisition of Suncorp superannuation business. On the 1st of July, we celebrated the completion of LGI Super's merger with Energy Super, which was a major milestone for our fund. It's been an exciting time. If you're a member watching this webinar tonight, you're now part of a strong Queensland-based super fund of $24 billion managed on behalf of 123,000 member accounts. As we continue to grow, we will always retain our unique member-centred approach and our commitment to customised investment for each member as a truly boutique profit for member fund. Our size gives us an edge compared to mega funds and allows us to respond to the distinctive superannuation needs of, of our members. In this rapidly changing superannuation sector, we always want to be agile and responsive to ensure we give you the best outcomes. Bringing together our two funds just does that. While we put the finishing touches on our transformation into one fund, our priority as always will be to ensure that we continue to deliver strong long-term investment performance, reliable returns and reduced fees for you. Looking into the future, we're working towards being the best super fund we can be for you. And key to that will be the integration of Suncorp superannuation business in the first half of 2022. This will also mean more growth and opportunities for all members. Over time, we expect that our increased size and scale will enable us to deliver you better services and lower costs. It will also give us access to a wider range of investment opportunities. Ultimately, once the acquisition is complete, we will see a combined fund size of $28 billion and a membership of over 250,000. This will achieve an ideal sustainable fund size, which will enable us to provide maximum benefit to you while maintaining our personalised service. As part of a fund with this ideal scale, all members can expect to see several benefits as the integration develops. These include an increased range of investment opportunities, 
strong and sustainable long-term returns, lower investment and administration fees, access to enhanced products and services, greater access, importantly, and presence in regional areas. As a $28 billion fund, we will also have increased access to high-performing mid-market investments with a focus on assets that build communities and support our members where they live and work. Into 2022, we plan to keep Suncorp operating as a standalone entity with its own trustee board. In the medium term, we plan to mutualise and put the ownership of the fund in the hands of all members. As we've previously mentioned in some of our communications on the acquisition, LGI Super and Energy Super account holders can also be assured the Suncorp transaction won't have a direct impact on your membership. You will continue to receive the same level of great service that you've always experienced with us. In the long term, the Suncorp funds will transition under a new brand and I look forward to keeping you updated on our progress as that unfolds. So I'd now like to welcome John Mulcahy, our Advice Manager. Thank you, Kate. And thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Well, thinking and planning for retirement can certainly be scary. And why wouldn't it be? At the moment, you're probably an expert in your field, you're getting paid regularly and hopefully en enjoying yourself. And retirement is potentially going from that to, to not being paid, maybe dealing with Centrelink for the first time, and possibly thinking and, and having some investment concerns, possibly more so than you, than you had previously. So what can you do about that? Well, to me, trying to be clear about where you want to get to and then building the wealth and utilising it effectively is a really key aspect to trying to um, take some of that fear away. And certainly that's what we're hoping to assist you with here tonight. Before we start though, uh, I guess one thing we have to always point out is we can't just sit here and say to you, this is what you should do, A, B and C. Uh, the information will give you quite a bit of information tonight, but it is important to point out that that's general advice or general information. So it's, it's critical that you then go away and consider how that may or may not be appropriate uh, for your circumstances. Now having said that, of course, the last thing we want to do is just throw a lot of information at you and leave you to your own devices. So rest assured, we are here to help and I'll come back to that and, and confirm that with you before we finish. Also, you can expect in the email from us following the presentation, a small workbook, and the idea of that is so that you can have some information, some of the numbers that we'll talk about tonight, and also a couple of questions to maybe challenge you on where are you at the moment with your understanding of your superannuation account, and what the next steps, a bit of a guide perhaps to what the next steps for you might be in making sure that you are tracking uh, and getting yourself ready for, for retirement. So at the moment, I would argue probably many Australians, and, and this may apply to you, tend to go through our working life uh, and be quite focused on, on the now and, and sort of muddle through, if you like. We get paid and, and live and, and possibly aren't giving as much thought to, to the future and to retirement, although clearly you're all joining us tonight, so that doesn't apply to you. Um, but I would argue that a better approach to take is to know, well, where is it that I want to get to? What, it, what does that retirement look like that I would like to achieve? And then working towards it. And that's what we'll, we'll look at now. So really, that starts with, how do you want to spend your time in retirement? As you can see from these images, when we, when we talk to people about retiring, we do often hear about spending time with the family and being able to travel. Uh, and clearly at the moment travel is quite a bit different to, to what we've traditionally known it and, and in the future who knows maybe there's different types of passports that we need but let's hope, let's hope we get there soon. But I guess one of the key things I, I like to call out about this is it's, well it's great to have these broad feel good ideas about retirement. It's equally important or more important I think to make sure we're thinking about well how are you going to spend that, that time, that eight to five, five days a week or whatever your work regime is and replace that with something purposeful and, and meaningful for you so that you're still enjoying, enjoying life and um, have, have thought that through. And also what's, what's so important about that is because it leads us to understand what retirement is actually going to cost us and that's, that's where we'll start tonight. Now in a lot of the material you might hear from us or, or certainly other people in, in the retirement industry uh, is this term comfortable. 
what, what does that really mean? Well, when we're talking about comfortable, certainly when we're talking about it tonight, it's things like knowing you've got money and can afford to, to go and eat out a few times or a week or, or whatever that is for you and not have to feel guilty. Being able to enjoy those, those personal um, treats, if you like, or, or hobbies and interests of pastimes uh, that, you, that you enjoy now or maybe even new ones that you want to take up in retirement. And these days being able to uh, afford and maintain the, the technology, phones, tablets and, and affording the, the data to go with that so you can enjoy using those in, in the way that you do. Not only that, it's, it's things like uh, certainly for homeowners, houses wear out, so being able to afford the maintenance and, and upkeep on those. Uh, similarly to houses, we wear out as well and so things like private, being able to maintain private health insurance and so you, again you can get things fixed when you need, when you would like it, rather than having to necessarily maybe wait until the system tells you that you can. Similarly, it's, it's the ability to be able to maintain a, a slightly better vehicle or, or more reliable vehicle perhaps. Um, and lastly, in general, just being able to enjoy those sort of household everyday luxuries that uh, most of us, I guess, have come to, come to know and love. And really, it's, it's how you combine all of these things that are going to tell you what, how much you need or what retirement's going to cost you. Uh, and so I would argue that probably the best place to start, if, if you haven't already, is really to, to understand your budget. Where is your money going now? What are you spending your money on? And then what is going to change as you move into retirement? Because those costs might go up with some, in with some interest, uh, but also there might be other costs that go away. Now, if you're not quite at that point yet, that's fine. Uh, ASFA does some work for you to maybe help you out with that. Now, ASFA stands for the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia. And every quarter they survey retirees to get an idea of what retirement is costing people right now. And the numbers you can see on the side, and these, these details are in the workbook that you'll receive as well. So hopefully you can see that's around about a bit over 44,000 if you're a single, and it's starting to approach 63,000 as a couple. Now, some of you out there might look at that and think, yeah, that seems about right, or, or it might come as a bit of a shock. But as I say, it's really, an average is one thing, but what's most important is, is what you like doing and, and putting a cost on that. Because really, comfortable is, is a very personal thing. I've had clients who have 30, spend $30,000 a year, and, and that is certainly comfortable for them. But at the same time, I've got clients who that figure is more like $100,000 a year. So it's, it could be anywhere in between. But as a starting point, obviously, these numbers can be, can be quite useful. And what's so important about that, and certainly from a financial planning point of view, once we know what that annual figure is, and if we know when you would prefer to retire, then we can start to, to build some numbers around that to know, well, can I actually afford to retire, or what, what should that target be? So again, you can see here, we've got two groups of, of numbers, one being with the support of the age pension, and others if you're looking to self-fund retirement. Now with this one, I guess the question is, which, which one should you look at? And I would suggest that that probably depends a bit on how old are you now. So if you're close to retirement and reasonably close to your retirement, uh, sorry, your age pension age, um, and those age pension ages now are either 66 and a half or 67, and for most of you, uh, I'm sure it would be 67. Um, because if you're reasonably close to, to retirement, age pension age now, then I would suggest working or relying on the age pension numbers are, are quite reasonable because of the proximity, if you like. Now, if you're younger, maybe 50s, for example, or even younger, again, firstly, good on you for joining us tonight. The earlier you start, the better you'll be in the long run, that's for sure. Um, but if, if you're in that situation, I would encourage you to, at this stage of life, forget about the age pension. And I don't say that from a perspective that it's not likely to be there. Certainly neither side of politics are making those sort of noises. But if, if, if you're age, if 10 years or more away from that age pension age, then I'd encourage you to control what you can control, and that is your wealth creation. Um, because with 10 or more federal budgets, who, who knows exactly what, what the rules are. Will it still be as generous, as, uh, if that's the right word, uh, to use as, as it is today? Now, a couple of... Uh, so these numbers here, also just around that, because the numbers, if you want to retire younger, and good luck to you if you do, but certainly that probably means that you'll need a, an, extra, uh, an extra savings to be able to do that. 
also if, if leaving more money behind for the family in, and is important. And I'll see the, the head shaking there now, I'm sure. Um, but a little bit of warning, so things to watch out for with these numbers. There's, there's some clear assumptions that we've made here. And first one is that you're a homeowner and it's gonna fund a retirement of 20 years. Now the reason we use that number is for currently life expectancy for people retiring in their sort of mid 60s is around about that 20 year mark. But once again, if, if your parents uh, you know, live in their 90s or grandparents, then again, you might have to look at a, a longer than average life expectancy or, or funding period in retirement. Um, so 20 years, it's, it's 44,000 a year if you're a single, 62,000 a year if you're, if you're a couple. So after 20 years, those investments are used up. If you're a home, well, homeowner, you still own your home. And assuming an investment in a sort of mid-range type of investment. So that's really where we suggest you start. V start to visualise that retirement and be able to put some dollars around that to know that's my goal. And from there, we can move on, which we'll get to now. Um, before we do just continue, again, I would like to thank you for joining us and welcome anyone who has joined us since the start. I'd also like to remind you that we are definitely interested in your questions, so please uh, feel free to use that little hand icon and send any questions through as we go. Now, in Australia, certainly for most people, we would argue that once you look at what that goal is and, and where you are at the moment, if there is a gap, then superannuation is, is really likely to be the best solution available for you. Certainly not saying it's the only solution, but for reasons I think we'll show you, it's quite compelling. Uh, now, even though the government does a good job of making it seem very complicated, uh, it's really a pretty simple concept because how much you have when you retire is going to come down to just two things, and that's how much you put in and how you choose to invest it. And let's have a look at that investment piece right now. Uh, as Kate's already said, we're very fortunate tonight to be joined not only by Troy Rick, the, the Chief Investment Officer, but also Kevin Wenlum. Sorry, he's uh, his deputy. So now I'd like to hand over to, to Troy and Kevin. Thanks. Good evening, good evening, everybody, and thanks for your time tonight. Now, Kevin and I have prepared some slides to illustrate our discussion, but what we'd really like to do is to answer your questions. So as John says, if you've got some questions, just click on that little blue hand icon at the top of the screen and send them on through. Let's start tonight with the obligatory COVID-19 chart. What we're looking at here is a chart of daily infection rates across the country. Now, we've been very lucky in Queensland. We had a short, sharp lockdown and now we're out. But the situation in Victoria has started to deteriorate. We have a nighttime, nighttime curfew in place. And in New South Wales, it probably feels like that curfew will never come to an end. They're now reaching week eight of the lockdown. On the right-hand side of the chart, of course, we can see this outbreak in New South Wales very clearly. But let's keep this in perspective. Turn our minds back a year and that bright red spike that we see there in Victoria. I'm sure we remember it well. Almost 700 dead across three months. Thousands and thousands of infections. So the message I take away from the chart here is that the, the context, the benchmark for what we consider to be a COVID-19 outbreak continues to evolve over time. And what gives me a great deal of confidence here is that as the vaccine program continues to roll out across the country, we'll be in a better position to control and suppress COVID-19 impacts heading into Christmas. And I think we're all looking for the opportunity to have a little bit of Christmas cheer this year. I know that I am. Now, of course, controlling COVID-19 is very important, not just for the health impacts that it generates, but also the stress that it places on our society. Now, as an investor, I'm also interested in the impact that it has on the economy and therefore on members' account balances through the financial markets. What we're looking at here is a chart of economic activity in Australia, in the light blue line, the United States in red, and Europe, which is the dark blue line. And you can see that recent surge of activity in Europe in particular and a steady increase in new economic activity through the US over the year. Now Australia, unfortunately with the COVID outbreak, we've had a downturn there at the top right hand side of the chart, but from very high levels. And it's very easy to forget how good we've had things here in Australia relative to the rest of the world. Now again, what I take away from that chart is, as we get COVID-19 back under control, the economic activity here in Australia is going to pick up again. And Australia of course is well positioned as the global economy continues to get back on track particularly our exposure in China. And one of the reasons that's very important is that share markets are continuing to react to the current situation in different ways. 
in particular, I think I characterise their reaction as looking through COVID-19 into the future. What we're showing here is a chart of the S&P 500 index, which is the big share market in the United States in the top left-hand corner, and our own ASX 200 index in the bottom right-hand corner. And I've started from 1 July 2019, so reaching back to the start two financial years ago and having a look at returns over the last two financial years through to Tuesday, which is the 17th of August. And what you can see here is that COVID-19 drawdown. We had a peak to trough drawdown of about 35% towards the start of 2020. But share markets bounced back quickly and recovered. And since that time, they've roared on to all-time highs. So for the S&P 500 index, investors from 1 July 2019 through to Tuesday have achieved returns of more than 50% in US dollar terms. And for our own share market here in Australia, the capital return is more than 30%. And then you can add on about 10% for dividends and franking credits over that time period as well. That's a fantastic outcome. Share markets are certainly quite buoyant at the present time. They're really reacting positively to future economic growth expectations. So why are share market investors so positive, so buoyant at the present time? Well, one of the reasons behind that is that we're seeing continual upgrades in economic forecasts and therefore in profit growths. So what we're looking at here in the bottom left-hand chart is a forecast for profit growth over the next three years for global stock markets. And in the top right-hand corner, it's a series of earnings per share upgrades for our own share market here in Australia. Now those bright blue lines you can see there in the bar chart are what investors are expecting for various types of shares in 2021. Some really solid profit growth there. But they're also expecting solid profit growth to continue into 2022 and 2023. So given that increased confidence about corporate earnings and profit growth, share market investors are paying up. They're paying a higher price for each dollar of future profits. And that's feeding through to all-time share price increases. That's why share market investors are so buoyant at the present time. I'm going to hand over to my compatriot, Kevin, at this point in time. Thanks, Troy. So I'm going to spend the next couple of slides talking about uh, infrastructure and property along with interest rates. So looking at the chart that we've got here on, uh, on the slide, you can see the line and you know, as we all know, housing prices have gone up significantly in the past 12 months. You know, across the country, it's been around 16%. And this has been largely a function of the low interest rate environment. And I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But we've also seen uh, house prices, particularly in regional centres for the first time in probably about 15 years, outperform uh, major cities. Uh, in particular, we saw house prices in Darwin and Hobart increase by more than 20%. Uh, in Sydney, Brisbane and Adelaide, they increased by more than 15%. Talking now about uh, infrastructure and property, if we look at the chart at the top left, you know, this is a chart showing returns for infrastructure. So we're looking at the line here, that, which is in red. What you can see here is, is that you know, infrastructure returns have, have basically delivered somewhere between 10 and 15% uh, year on year. But you can see in that period around March last year, there was a significant dip. So just as a reminder, infrastructure assets are things like airports, toll roads, you know, seaports, electricity networks, and power generation, including renewables. And by way of example, some of the assets that LGI Super and Energy Super members own include things like the Port of Melbourne, uh, Port of Brisbane. Uh, we have a whole suite of airports. So I'll start from the Gold Coast. So we've got Gold Coast, we've got Sunshine Coast, we've got Townsville, Cairns, Perth. Internationally, we own airports like Brussels Airport, for example. Uh, other international assets will include things like uh, Fenerge, which is the second largest wind generation uh, company in, in Portugal. Uh, things like uh, Wheel Operator, which is a waste energy company in the UK. But you can see that, you know, that performance that we saw in, in March last year, that was primarily due to things like transport assets. You know, as you'd expect due to lockdowns, uh, those transport assets or the patronage of those transport assets was relatively low because people were locked down. But you can see that you know, the returns have been, uh, they've improved you know, since that March to June period last year. And things, uh, demand for things like electricity obviously hasn't waned. Uh, similarly for things like seaports. You know, we've seen lots of goods come through seaports because what have people done when they've been locked down? They've been shopping. So those seaports have seen lots of uh, goods come through them and um, the, the performance of those assets has been quite, quite good. Looking at the, uh, the chart at the bottom right, you know, that represent, represents uh, a mix of property and in particular things like shopping centres, uh, offices and industrial properties. So industrial properties are things like warehouses. 
So again, by way of example of some assets which LGI Super and Energy Super members own, there'll be things like Rabina Town Centre uh, down on the Gold Coast, there'll be shopping centres, um, sorry, there's the uh, Grand Central Toowoomba uh, Shopping Centre. You know, we've got a portfolio of office assets here in Brisbane. Uh, we also own uh, part of um, Waterfront Place and some offices obviously in places like Sydney and Melbourne. In terms of the returns, again, you can see that there was a dip uh, in the red line in that March to uh, June period. Uh, that was predominantly retail assets and, you know, or, or shopping centres in other words. And you know, they obviously fell as a result, again, of you know, those assets not being able to be used by people because they are in lockdown. Now, I talked earlier about you know, house prices, for example, going up as a function of interest rates. So if we look to the very um, far left of both of the charts we look at, and the top one is the 10-year government bond yield, and the bottom left one is the cash yield. So if we look at, say, the cash yield, which is the, uh, the bottom one on the left, you know, the Reserve Bank of Australia this week, or sorry, last week, you know, announced or reconfirmed that interest rates would remain at all-time lows of 0.1%. You know, similarly, we can see at the top chart, you know, bond yields are, are very, very low as well for 10-year bonds. If we think about you know, where um, interest rates and mortgage rates were, say, 20 years ago, back in 1990, so to the very far left of the chart to the, at the bottom, you know, mortgage rates at that time, uh, for those of us that are old enough to remember, you know, they were probably around 18 to 20 percent. So, you know, that's a, a fairly hefty interest payment. Now, interest rates for, on mortgages are probably somewhere between two and a half to three percent. Um, Five-year fixed rates, for example, are in a similar range. So, whether it's fixed or variable, you can you can see that you know, compared to say 18 to 20 percent a little over 20 years ago to two and a half to three percent now, interest payments are much cheaper. So, people now it's much cheaper to service their loans. So, what are people doing? Well. You know, if you put it in the bank at 0.1%, that's not really great. So people are looking for greater returns and housing is one source of uh, returns for those investors. So thinking about you know, what we've seen in the past you know, 18 months or so, you know, the economy, as you know, Troy showed earlier, particularly the share market, has bounced back significantly. And that reflects stronger commodity prices and those rising share prices. And they've translated into fantastic returns for our members. Um, Troy's going to spend a little bit of time talking about those returns in a moment, and I'll hand it back to Troy. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, and it is a fascinating time period to be an investor. Uh, those share market returns that I demonstrated there previously have been feeding through to member account balances, and we've delivered some really pleasing outcomes for the last financial year. So that's 1 July 2020 to 30 June 2021. For those members who've chosen to invest in quite risky options, so that's things like aggressive, for example, or growth, your dedication to the risk allocation has been outsized rewarded in the last financial year. So returns of 19 to 21%, for example, as we're showing here on the screen. On the left-hand side, the LGI super options. On the right-hand side, the options for energy super members. And it's important to remember, all of the returns that we're showing here for you this evening are after investment fees and taxes have already been deducted and after the 18 basis points administration fee has also been taken out. We're real big believers in after fees and taxes returns here. Members in my super, the flagship option, have also been handsomely rewarded over the last 12 months. Returns of 15 to 17.7%. Even our more conservative options have delivered solid returns. These have been powered along by share market returns of 26 to 30%, as you can see from our single, single sector options in the second half of the screen. Now, the really pleasing part about this, of course, for us, is that members have been able to stay invested in these long-term investment programs, you've seen an outsized reward for your discipline. The ability to stay the course, whatever your investment strategy happens to be, gives you the best possible chance of compounding your wealth up over time. If you're a pension member, congratulations, your returns are even higher because you don't pay income taxes on your returns. So for our pension members, again, you've had an outsized reward in the last 12 months for staying the course with your investment program. And the thing that's really pleasing about these outcomes for us, the thing we think is really great on behalf of the membership, is the fact that as you're drawing down income to live your life in retirement, we're here working with you to build your account balance, to compound it up over time, to maintain the real value of your retirement portfolio. We know how important that is to all members. Now, I'd love to guarantee you that returns for the coming financial year are going to be just as good. We're still expecting solid returns, but I don't think we're going to see the same sort of outsized returns that we've seen in the last 12 months. I'm looking forward to taking your questions, as is Kevin. Thanks again for your time tonight, everybody. We'll speak soon. And it's back to you, John. Thank you, Troy.
and Kevin, and I can certainly confirm that there's a few members of my household who have been helping, trying to help fill those containers coming in through the ports. So, yes, yeah, so I have to have a word to them. So, as, as Troy and Kevin have just showed us, there's a lot going on in the world of investments. Well, the world itself is complex enough, and then you try and read that and, and work out how to invest. Certainly easier things in life. So what, what chance have we got? Well, I would suggest that when we're dealing with such complexity, then the best solution is, is probably a simple one. And that's where the good news comes in. So regardless of whether you're, you're an energy member or an LGA super member, then you can see, and, and what this slide shows you, is that we've got a range of simple diversified options that will be suitable to you, in, in, certainly in the vast majority of cases. So the slide just illustrates, uh, so the names in green represent the LJ super options and the energy super options are shown in orange. But from through from a, the lower risk end of the spectrum through to the more aggressive end, there's a range of options available to you so that you can choose either a single or a combination of options that are going to be right for you. And the key thing about which option or options are right, it really comes down, and, and Troy was touching on it a moment ago, what is the expected return from a particular option and what's the, the risk or what sort of, what's the year-to-year -year journey of volatility going to look like with that? And that's really what I'd like to build on with you now. So let's start with, with a bit of a guess, a crystal ball at what the future might look like. So what we've got here, so we've selected a range of extremes, so an aggressive, defensive option, uh, so each end of that diversified spectrum that we were just talking about, and then also cash, which is just like cash as you know it at the bank. So what this shows us, the green boxes, is the expected maybe average return of each of those options for the next seven years. So with aggressive, that's a forecast of approximately, sorry, 6.3%. Defensive, it's 2%. And for cash, 0.5%. And again, as Kevin was just talking about, who, who could imagine that we're, we're here with cash at, at basically zero? And many parts of the world where it's actually negative. It's quite, quite amazing. Um, so now, the other important aspect of this slide is that little black dot, because what that represents is inflation, which we're all familiar with, whether we know the term or not, and that is it typically costs more each year to live. So the increase in, in the cost of living each year, and that's forecast over that same period at about 1.6%. So what you can see here with the aggressive option that's the one that gives us the best chance of beating inflation. So we call that the real rate of return because you've got to match inflation before you're even getting anywhere. So with defensive at a 2% versus 1.6, you can see we still expect to get a slight real return, albeit certainly nowhere near as significant. And with cash, we're almost guaranteed well, you, to get poorer each year with money that we have in cash. Why would we invest in cash then? Well, I'll come back to that in just a moment. So if we move on, what we see here is what, what, will the sorry, what will the returns possibly look like? Because what we do know is they're not going to be that return every year for seven years. Now, for any, anyone who likes maths out there, and uh, I've been sort of doing some surveys recently as I've been travelling, and uh, I can, people either genuinely don't like maths or they don't like admitting that they like maths. So um, if you do like maths, what this represents is basically plus or minus one standard deviation. Uh, for all the normal people joining us and watching, basically what that means is that band between the grey box at the bottom and the orange one at the top is we would expect most returns during that seven year period, one year returns, to fall within that, within that range. So for aggressive, that's anywhere from around 18% in a good year to minus 5% in a bad year. For defensive, you can see that's a lot closer together. So maybe positive 5% to maybe minus 1%. And cash, very compressed. And if we do get a negative return, it's likely to be very small. Okay. Now, of course, we don't know the future. Now, that doesn't mean every year the return will fall within that. So there is a chance that occasionally returns might either be better than we show you there or worse. Okay. So going back to my question, why would you invest in cash then? Well, that's really the answer. Cash is perfect for money that we need soon. If you've got your normal living expenses or a planned expense coming up, rates or, or a car or a holiday, then really should, shouldn't be gambling with that money. 
But if it is money for retirement that you're not going to touch for 5, 10 or 15 years, then does it really matter what happens next year if we got confident that it's going to generate a good return for us when, for when we actually need it? So it's all well and good to guess about the future. So let's look at why we might have some confidence that what we're talking about could actually be what happens. So to do that, we've gone back and chosen a seven year period. In this case, we've gone back quite a way, as you can see there, we've gone back to 2009. Why? Well, I didn't want to just cherry pick the good times, um, but actually choose something that had a significant event. And many of you pro probably remember 2009, was getting towards the end of a global financial crisis, which was the most significant financial event in 100 years. So what the slide shows you, all the different colours, basically every colour represents the annual return for that particular year for each of the three options. So the first point I guess I'd like to make with this is to show you or, or ask you, what do you notice about the shape of the graph relative to the previous one? Yeah, and that is that with aggressive, as we estimated for the future that we would expect to get quite a high variation of returns from one year to the next, well, it is actually what happened. You can see they ranged in that seven year period from, it was around about 17 to 18% in the best year in 2013, uh, and the worst of 2009 in the GFC of around about minus 17% there for, for that option. Uh, and again, defensive, much more compressed, and cash once more, so again, the, the safety of cash. Again, the, 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 the temptation can be, and again, Troy alluded to this when he was speaking a moment ago, in 2009 when everything's going bad and you're watching the news and, and there's, no, there's nothing good to look forward to, the temptation can certainly be, I've got to get, especially if you're retired, I've got to get my money, stop losing it. And it, it, that drawer of a, a small positive return in cash can be very attractive. But if you look at what followed 2009 in terms of returns, your reward, if you stay put, then, then the reward comes. So again, yes, there was an outcome outside the band that we would normally expect, but there was a reasonable expectation or a reasonable explanation, I guess, for that. So it's really about having an appropriate strategy and being prepared that's, that's right for you and sticking to it. Um, and you shouldn't need to really change a strategy when the next COVID or, or the next event comes along if you've considered that appropriately. But look, the other thing that often gets forgotten when, when things do go bad is what came before it. So here I have chosen the seven year period that came between the global crisis and the COVID event uh, of the, or effect of early last year that again, that gentleman showed us before. So you can see here that the shapes are still similar. Yes, aggressive certainly still had the widest range of returns from one year to the next uh, and less so with defensive and cash. But you can also see there, were, there was no disaster in this period of time. So the returns, yes, uh, the 2012 was still negative by about minus one, one percent. Um, but the other years were all very strong and more than able to offset that. And again, to use Troy's word, the reward for, for staying invested. But I started talking about an average. So, let, so let's go back to that. So over the seven year period, that, so the five year average for that first period, including the GFC, um, you can say, well, John, you, you, you weren't exactly true there. So uh, you can see there wasn't a big outperformance between aggressive and defensive, but it did outperform. So 5.8% per annum over those seven years versus 5.1% per annum. Um, but yeah, certainly not what we expected. Uh, and again, both did outperform cash, which is again, what we would, what we would expect over time not in any one year, but definitely over longer periods of time. In, in aggressive defence there, it's probably more really a, a 10 year option as well, rather than seven. So what if, we, what if we look at the seven years that excluded the GFC? And you can see here that reward for staying invested over a long time and, and enjoying the recovery that so often or ever, always follows the downturn is rewarded. So you can see over that seven year period, people in the aggressive option were rewarded with 13.6% versus only 16 and a half in defensive, and again, only 3.4 in, in cash. So that's really what's important about investing, is understanding time and, and, and choosing a strategy and being able to stick to it. So what does that mean for you, and, and where should you start in applying that to your super account? And I'm certainly not saying, even if you've got 10 years to retirement, that you should just put your super in aggressive. Definitely not what I'm saying. But the starting point is time. 
when do you need, and this is super or, or any money really, how, how long have I got until I need to spend this money? That's really where you start. But as I was just touching on, you do need to overlay that with how comfortable are you with some of these concepts? Because if in, in March last year, when your diversified growth option dropped by 17% in a month, you're like this gentleman lying awake at night, then that's possibly not the right place for your money. So it's, it's, uh, it's applying both of those things for you. And I would argue, yes, I'm a bit biased, but this is one of the areas where the value of financial advice can really come in because it's, it's not always about uh, saving you money, but it's also about protecting you from yourself. Humans, we're a funny creature and fear and greed uh, are very significant uh, factors when it comes to investing. And so applying that to super again to, to round this out, it comes back to um, there's two key time frames for super that I would argue. So the first one from how old are you now until you plan to retire, because really your super's only job in that time frame, frame is to grow. But then how long until, uh, sort of from retirement, from when you retire uh, until the end of retirement, I won't try and guess that. Uh, because I think there's a real risk there sometimes of focusing on the retirement date. And I sometimes use the analogy of, to me that's like looking at the, at the window frame and not through the window at, at the view. Because yes, you might, even if you're gonna retire in 12 months, uh, so you might need some of that money quite soon. If you focus on that and are too conservative, it will cost you dearly in the, in the long run. So once again, that rounds out our investment section. So please, if you do have questions, use the little hand icon and, and send them through. And, and thanks again for anyone who's, who's joined us. Now to sort of round out my section before we, we, we round out and, and get to your questions, I guess this, we've, we've covered the investment side of the equation. So let's consider about growing it and some of the opportunities that are there currently. And there's a couple of types of super and uh, sorry contributions, and I'll start on the ones for where we get there's, there's tax benefits available. And firstly, a quick tax lesson. I won't spend too much time on this, um, but I find that it's, it's not overly well understood the tax system in Australia. And again, probably not surprising the way the government goes about things. But what we're looking at here is we've got a tiered tax system. So for any dollar of income you earn between forty-five thousand and one hundred twenty thousand dollars, you pay. 34 and a half cents tax on that. That includes your Medicare levy. Now, in superannuation money, that is taxed at 15%. So I'm sure if I were to ask you which you prefer to, to pay, uh, most of us would say 15. But most of us are still missing out on this opportunity. Now, what does that mean in dollar terms? So let's say out of $5,000 that I earn in that band, well, I'm going to pay $1,725 tax on that if I earn it as salary. If, however, I direct it to super through what's commonly known as salary sacrifice or maybe claiming a personal deduction for that, that reduces to $750. Again, I'm talking about people on that income band between forty-five and $120,000. So that's around about $1,000 tax saving in one year. So depending on how long you've still got until you retire, you can potentially compound that each year over that time frame. Let's look at a small, a quick example. So Jack, when Jack was 60, he decided, I'm gonna retire in five years. I've heard all these people at work talking about salary sacrifice, so I might do a bit too. So he decides to put an extra 5,000 a year into his super. So you can see that would result in an additional 20 odd thousand dollars for Jack. And importantly, or, or I guess attractively, 5,000 of that has basically been saved from, from, from the tax man being shipped down to Canberra. But another point I'd like to make, and this one might be a bit more contentious, uh, but I'd also argue the main reason that Jack's got an extra 21000 is that by putting it into super, he couldn't spend it. Um, you know, we've now got $3 trillion, and, and Troy can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's 12 zeros, a three with 12 zeros after it. That's just a, a mind-boggling number. But I would argue that we wouldn't have that sort of money and retirement savings in Australia if we hadn't been protected from ourselves and not be able to access it along the way. So that is certainly a key aspect as well. Now look, there is some bad news. Uh, unfortunately, there are limits. Uh, the good news is this did go up a little bit on the 1st of July, but it's currently 27,500 a year for which you can get some tax benefits. And the main point I'd like to make on this is it does also include what your employer is putting in for you as well. So not just to apply to what you're doing yourself. But there's also some recent good news. Um, and I'd just like to take you, explain that a little bit and, and take you through an example. Because uh, this is certainly one that I and, and my fellow financial advisors get quite excited about. 
So this is called a catch up. So before, if you didn't use that yearly threshold, well, that was just foregone. But since July 2018, when this first came into play, any unused part of the cap each year now gets rolled forward. So in this basic example, you can see if I was contributing $10,000 in, in that first year, the 15 I didn't use now rolls forward. So at the start of year two, I've got 40,000 available, and now at the start of year three, 55,000. So, and this can compound for up to five years. So there's is a growing opportunity here for people to, to really get some good tax benefits and, and boost that super prior to retirement once again. So let's look at a, a bit of an example there. So let's say I'm on $70,000. As I was just alluded to a moment ago, that means $25,000 of what I'm earning, I'm paying 34 and a half cents tax on. So if I could get a, my taxable income down to 45,000, that means now the highest rate of tax I'll pay on my personal income is 21%, 21 cents in the dollar. Pretty attractive, I would say. There's different ways to get a tax deduction, but what if I could put that 25,000 into my super so I've got it there for when I retire as well? Could I do it and what would, what would be the benefit? So again, what I can't ignore is, so, sorry, in this example, I'm already doing a bit of salary sacrifice, $4,200, so it means to get that total deduction of 25,000, I need to do an additional 20,800. But I also need to remember my employers paying the compulsory super as well. So to actually get my 25 in, that means I need a total of 33,400 contributed to my super this year. Now, in years gone by, unfortunately that would have just been bad luck. But now, I actually can do it. Because like I said, this started back in July of 2018, so now in this financial year, we're in the fourth year of this, so these numbers are starting to get quite significant. In this scenario, that means by not using the full cap each year, I'm starting this year with about 64, uh, nearly 67,000, sorry, nearly 65,000 in, uh, in a threshold to use this year. So I can definitely do 33,400, and I'm still gonna have a significant amount to roll forward next year to maybe repeat it. Now what I haven't already mentioned, and is definitely a very critical point, is that it does require you to have less than half a million dollars in your super, and that's a combination of as many, all your super, regardless of where it is, uh, at the start of the financial year. So this is certainly uh, an exciting opportunity. So what's that worth if I can do it? So let's go back to that, to that personal income tax. If I, that 20, that extra 20,800, if I do just continue to earn it as income, well, the personal tax I pay there, $7,176. If I can get that into super with that, to that tax deduction, sorry, the super is gonna pay, I'm going to pay $3,120 within the super account, which means there's a little over $4,000 that I'm saving in just this year alone. We've had a scenario recently with a client where we've given advice and, and saved over $11,000 just in one year by utilising this, this strategy. Now, that's all well and good. I know you're probably all racing to the bedroom to get the Milo tin and, and pull that $20,000 out, but uh, is, is there another way? So let's look at it. Take a step back. What does work and, and, and live, meeting our expenses look like at the moment? So while we're working, we get a salary. As I've already been talking about, the tax man gets paid first. Then we certainly have our fixed expenses, so we need somewhere to live, clothes, food, etc. And, and fun, and there's people out there watching, I'm, I'm a bit miserable about how much we're spending on fun, and I've already talked about this. Uh, because there is another jar, and that's called the future. So it's important to me to have that, that balance. I'm certainly not saying it's all about the future, but, but let's make sure we've got some balance there. And the future isn't next year's holiday either, by the way. It's, it's super savings and paying down debt and the like. But what if I could access money from super? Well, if you're 58 or older, guess what? You can. Now, in these examples I'm talking about tonight, I'm really talking to, the, to those of you, if you're there, or, or for when you get to age 60, uh, because the tax treatment prior to that is different, and, and you definitely need to be very careful if you are looking at this prior to age 60. Because... Once you get to that, what we call preservation age, so 58 or older, then you can access it, even if you are still working. So guess what? Maybe you can access money you've already got in super and put it back in to get that tax benefit. Or, uh, and this has sort of been lost a little bit over the years, I think since this first legislation came in, but it was actually brought in so that you could ease your way out of the workforce. So you might decide you want to go to four or three days a week. Well, tapping into your super for that little bit of extra income to supplement it, 
uh, could be an option as well. Um, these days, it's not uncommon leading into retirement. You might still have some, some mortgage or, or some other debts or like to be do, preparing for retirement, purchasing the car, doing some home, home improvements. And it can often make you feel, uh, people find that peace of mind to be able to deal with that so, sooner rather than later. And lastly, and unfortunately don't have time tonight to go into this in, in significant detail, but it can be really effective for estate planning as well. Because while you accessing your super after age 60 uh, is going to be tax free to you, depending on the composition of that super and who it gets paid to later, especially things like uh, people, not things, people like uh, adult children or, or brothers or sisters, uh, there may be tax to pay. And, and this can offer strategies to, to reduce or eliminate that. So how does a transition to retirement super or pension account work? Look, it's pretty simple. And firstly, importantly, it has no effect on your, on your employer. You don't even have to tell them. We take a big chunk of money from our super accumulation account and start a pension account. As I said a moment ago, if you're over 60, there's no tax to pay on the money you pull out. And the key number, the key figure here as well, is there is a limit. So it's limited to 10% a year. But let's go back to that scenario I just had. If I'm 60 and I've got 200,000 in my super, well, I could start a pension, draw that 20,000, and potentially there's my tax deductible contribution to my super account with no negative impact on my cash flow. Now, I'd still challenge you to do a budget and make sure that there's not other, other money you could be, or better benefits you could be getting. But starting a pension through your super, the money hits your bank account, you then have the choice of how you use it. Is it a super contribution or any of those other strategies that I, that I mentioned a moment ago? Now, in addition to the salary sacrifice and deductible contributions, there's also additional contributions we can make, which we often call personal or tax-free or after-tax contributions. Now, you can see on the left of your screen there, uh, that threshold, and some of you will notice that's different. It was 100,000, it's now 110,000 as of July this year. If you're not yet 67, there is also the potential to do up to three times that in one year. Um, so there's still the ability to get quite significant amounts of super. Now, if you're already at 1.7 million or more, then unfortunately the, the door's shut on these, but most of us aren't there yet. Uh, some little auxiliary benefits here as well. You might have heard of co-contribution. If, if you or your spouse actually might only be part-time or even your children uh, and only earn a lower income, then for $1,000 put into certain accounts, you can actually receive up to $500 um, from the government, 50% return worth looking at. Similarly, if you do have a lower income spouse, then there's a thing called a spouse tax rebate, which can be as much as $540. Now on the right, and, and clearly all of you watching tonight are too young to worry about this one just yet, um, but in recent years, this downsizer strategy was brought in. So it's currently for people over 65, and it basically allows you, if you sell your principal home, there's a lot of fine print, and, and so you definitely, again, need to look into it if, you, if you're approaching that uh, consideration. Um, but it can allow you to get, again, up to 300000 or 600000 as a couple into super. And that one's regardless of how much you already have in super. So there's some interesting strategies there. Uh, if you're a keen follower of the federal budget, there was uh, an update in that this year. They are proposing to reduce that age to 60 from July next year. But again, not yet legislated, so we'll, we'll just watch that space. Now, what changes are retirement? I don't want to spend too much time on here, I'll just round this section out in return in terms of the age pension. Um, with, when we get to our age pension age, there's two tests that get applied to determine whether we get some age pension or not. First one I wanted to talk about is the income test. And again, this is in the workbook that, that you'll receive. The really, so I'm not going to focus so much on the, on the numbers there, 54,000 is where it cuts out. 83,000 as a couple combined income before you're not eligible for any age pension. Uh, but it, uh, the important message here is this one generally applies if, if someone is still working. So there's no actual requirement to retire to get the age pension. So make sure you keep that in mind too. Uh, and this has often been a, people have missed out, especially with couples where someone might hit their age pension age, but the spouse might still be working. So they just think, well, no, I can't. But if the spouse is only on part-time or a lower income, then you might be eligible for something sooner than you think. But certainly once you're fully retired, it's normally the asset test that applies. So here again, you can see these are where the, the numbers cut out. So if you're a homeowner and a single, that's almost not, uh, oh, sorry, almost 600,000 now before you get no age pension. And for couples, that's eight, over 880,000. And that excludes the value of your home. So uh, I, 
you know, do I use the word generous? Well, I don't know, it might be a bit going a bit far. But, but for those reasons is why most people retiring now will have some eligibility for the age pension, or at least in part. What's it worth? Well, here you can see if you're a single and on the maximum age pension, that's now a shade under 25,000, and for a couple combined, a bit better than 37,500. So from those numbers we saw earlier on, it's, it's not enough to, to meet that standard comfortable lifestyle, so you are gonna have to do a bit of work yourself, uh, but it's a pretty a good, I guess, safety net, which is kind of what the government talks about as well. Now just to round that out and a, and a little bit of an example, so what this column is designed to show you is the, the black or the, the long column is, is what a fortnightly income might look like for, for that comfortable retirement, for both a, comf uh, sorry, a single and a couple. And the colour bit is how much at different asset points you're getting from the government. So you can see there at about 270000 regardless if you're single or a couple, you're getting full age pension and you're needing to self-fund a little bit as well. Once we hit the 400,000 mark, well, singles are starting to, to only get a part, or they're, they're getting a part pension, and couples are still at full. We keep moving along, 588, singles are now fully self-funded, couples are still getting a bit. But as I said a moment ago, by the time we get to 884,000, well, it's all gone from the government. So what's the point of this? Well, really, I'd say, let's, let's read this right to left. Because when we retire, it's possibly the, the wealthiest you're going to be at that point, because then you are going to start to draw on it. And, and again, this might sound crazy, but I th I'd rather you get to retirement and not qualify for any age pension because it means you've done a great job on the wealth creation and you're going to have more options. But the point is, for most people, they might be starting to use a bit of their own money. So over time, the value of their super and other investments is likely to reduce. So as that does, though, you might fall under those thresholds and that asset threshold and start to get money from the government. So every dollar less you have to spend on yourself is, a, oh, sorry, the dollar you get from the government is one less that you have to spend of your own money. And that is one of the things that can make the retirement sustainable uh, and, and those earlier numbers I spoke about. So to round this out, why super? Look, I've been in the super industry for a long time. Not many people more brainwashed on its value than me, but over 60 retire money in super up to $1.7 million can be moved into a retirement pension and you can and get, as Troy said earlier, there's no tax to pay on those investment earnings. The income I draw out is tax free. And now there's still a minimum I have to draw, but there's no maximum. So I can draw the income I need or make lump sum withdrawals as I need to. A pretty good environment, a pretty good option. A couple, 3.4 million. If you've got a better way to, if you can you know, know another way to invest that much money tax free, let me know, but I'd be surprised if it's legal. Um, and so we get there, as I've said, the tax man goes away. We get income from our super. The future's now, so we've just got those fixed and fun uh, examples to look at. But I also said most of us are going to get something from the age pension, so we can potentially pay ourselves, get a bit of money from the government, and hopefully enjoy that, that comfortable retirement. So in bringing that together, as I said, well, as you've seen, there's, there's a lot of information there tonight, and there's a lot of things to think about. And we certainly don't want to just leave you to your own devices, but uh, depending on the degree of assistance you need, uh, call our contact centre, go online. Uh, if, you, if you don't already have access to Remember Online, that should probably be the first thing you do after the, after the session, so you can go and see what investment option you're in and contributions and the like. Um, but when you get to that point, uh, we've got assistance of, of general advice or, or general information as well. Um, but if you're at that point or when you get to that point, of really needing professional assistance to, to net this all together. If you want to try and make sure that you're not paying extra tax, if you want to protect yourself or, or make sure that your strategy's ready for the next investment correction, whether that's this year in five years time, you want to make sure the family are going to be looked after, then we've, our team of advisors can certainly assist you with that. So get in touch and, and we can talk you through and, and we can provide that personal assistance that you, that you need. So with that, thank you. I'll, I'll now hand back to, to Kate and we look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thanks, John, Troy and Kevin. So to all of our members, I hope you found that as informative as I did. And hopefully you now have some tips for managing your super in retirement. If you've only just joined us, uh, then my name is Kate Farrer and with me I have John Mulcahy, Troy Rick and Kevin Wan Lung. And tonight we covered getting set for retirement. But now we're going to take some of your questions. So if you haven't already, please submit your questions by clicking the blue hand on the top of the screen. 
So it's exciting. I've got a few questions here already. Just going to start with an administrative one from Mark. Will a copy of this webinar be available for reviewing later? Absolutely. Over the next week or so, we will have a copy uh, of this webinar available on our websites. So other questions. Um, we have one, I think, for you, Troy. Um, and this one is from Zach. What is your view on inflation post the COVID era? Uh, thank you, Zach, for your question. That is a very interesting one. We're certainly seeing some interesting things in terms of inflation. That is the general rise in prices in the economy at the present time. I think a lot of those are relatively transitory. Fancy word for the next 12 to 18 months. Think about oil prices, for example, and the interruption to global supply chains, the inability of manufacturers to completely fulfill supplies. Those sorts of issues have certainly driven up prices in recent times. I don't think we're going to return to the period of the 1970s and a severe inflation breakout. I know there are some people who are very concerned about that. As folks head into retirement, it's a very natural question to ask. We know that inflation eats into people's um, purchasing power. For me, the fact that companies are now getting very used to doing more with less. You know, we're all sitting here in an office this evening, but a lot of us are working at home on a regular basis. The extent to which companies continue to invest in technological solutions and building up their capital base. I think that inflation will get itself under control again relatively quickly. And for that reason, we don't think that inflation is going to be a huge issue in terms of investment returns over the next three to five years, but it's certainly something that people are talking about at the present time. Thanks very much, Troy. And in fact, I have another one for you now. Uh, hi, Troy. This is from David. Hi, Troy. As there was little effect on the Australian economy through the Victorian outbreak, will we expect the same with the current New South Wales outbreak? Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. I would certainly hope that the way that government support programs are currently operating, that the economic impact will be minimised. The challenge we have, though, is that the further these lockdown programs progress, Victoria is now in lockdown version six, people's savings do get eroded, their confidence becomes less and less resilient, and it becomes more and more of a struggle for those who are permanently working at home to continue with their lifestyles. My hope is that this is a fairly short outcome. I know people are now talking about potential lockdowns in New South Wales through the school holidays. There is only so much that governments can do. This is why it's so important for us to roll out that vaccination program. It gives us our best chance of getting back to a normal life, but also a normal level of economic activity. To the extent that things are a little bit soft at the present time, I'm hoping there's some pent up demand coming into Christmas. People desperate for a short holiday, desperate to spend some more money, boost those shipping containers coming through the ports that we own. Um, but as always is the case, the outcome is going to be uncertain. We've got our fingers crossed here. Great, thank you. I have one for you now, John, from Lana. Um, so does the $500,000 limit for catch-up contributions apply for defined benefit members? Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Lana. Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry, bad news. Yes, it applies to everyone. So it's a combination of all super accounts. So that's if you've got accumulation and or defined benefit, and or possibly money already in, in transitional pension accounts. So any individual's total combined super holdings, uh, if they're over 500,000 at the start of the financial year, then unfortunately that carry forward opportunity, uh, yeah, opportunity isn't going to be available. So I hope that's not bad. Well, I hope it is bad news, Lana, because it means that the yeah, account's looking pretty healthy. So. <laughs> Thanks. We've actually got a couple more for you, John, on catch-up contributions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a question from Leanne. Um, the contribution catch-up maximum balance of 500000 is that the combined total of husband and wife funds is the first one? Great. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, no, fortunately it is an individually applied, which is always the, the case with super. It's, in, it's a good question. I'll, I'll take a side step too there just because uh, it is a question we sometimes get, especially close to retirement. Some people sort of say, well, can I just move, you know, husband and wife just move theirs in together into one account? Uh, well, no, because in Australia, a superannuation account has to be held by an individual. But in this case, the good news for that is that it does mean that uh, husband and wife are looked at individually, uh, you know, husband or wife. <laughs> one could have $2 million in their account and uh, the other person could have nothing or, or any amount under 500,000, well, it's still available to them. And it's, I guess, just to not talk too long, but it, it's 
it's going to create another consideration for us, and, and your question's a good one to lead into that, is um, before we've sort of, with, with super rules in the past, we'd, we'd often just go, well, there was no real benefit in, in equalising and that type of thing, so we, we just go. But this does create that thought, maybe a bit earlier on in, in our working lives, we might start to think about partners uh, looking at ways to, to, to balance out accounts sooner to, to keep maybe both under thresholds for, for longer. And there are some strategies like contribution splitting, uh, which we, again, haven't gone into, but uh, that can help with that. So thank you, Leanne. Hope that answers it. And so next question for you from Tony. John, how do I find out if I can make catch-up payments and how do I find out how much I can contribute? Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Uh, Good questions, and as a, again, the, with my financial advisor hat on, if you can do this before you talk to us, excellent as well. Look, the easiest way um, is, because it is effectively centrally managed through the ATO. So I would suggest the, the most, or the, the simplest way, if you have MyGov access to your, to your ATO portal, you can go in there and it will tell you at the, for, any given, for the current financial year, what amount is available to you through those unused contributions from the past three years. And certainly, uh, if you meet with us, that's one of the things we'd be asking you to do, because yes, well, we can reconstruct it if everything you've got has been with us. Uh, as soon as you get into couples and, and maybe super in different places, uh, it really does mean that the ATO portal and, and MyGov is, is the best solution there. Brilliant. We have a question from Kevin for Kevin. <laughs> So are we moving away from fossil fuel investments and into clean green as the mature economies move at speed to zero emissions with all the opportunities this will create? So to answer the question about uh, are we moving away from fossil fuel opportunities, look, we, we consider all investment opportunities and we integrate environmental, social and governance factors through all of our investments. So for example, if, you know, by way of example, fossil fuels, if the opportunity is no longer there to make the returns that we ordinarily expect for our members, and the opportunities in other areas like renewables will certainly consider and, and probably make the switch. But you know, we assess all investments on an equal basis. So we're looking for you know, the best risk returns for our members. Thanks, Kevin. Another one for John. Uh, and this one is from Susan. Uh, hi, do we have to retire at a certain age? 65 or 67, thank you. Well, first. Hi, Susan. Um, good question as well. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because we often ask the question when we do these and we can see people and talk to people and ask that, that very question, is there a retirement age in, in Australia? And the answer to that is certainly no. If you've got uh, sufficient wealth at any point in time, then you, you, you can retire. Uh, clearly where there are rules though, is, as I touched on earlier, there is a, an eligibility age for the age pension. So there's certainly an age, the earliest at which you can qualify for the age pension. Uh, and similarly, there's an age, the earliest age at which you can access your superannuation. Um, so if you're wanting to retire extremely young in the super world, then that would require significant non-superannuation investments. Um, so yeah, short answer, no, there's no retirement age. Uh, whether there's a de facto retirement age because of your wealth is inside of super or, or other factors, then that age at which you can access your super being currently 58. Uh, and as I said, for uh, everyone now, if you're not already age pension age, it's either 66 and a half or 67, but no retirement age. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, another question for Troy, uh, and this one's from David. So, hi. Uh, recently, there was an article regarding superannuation companies looking to go overseas to diversify the portfolio. Will the combined group be looking to follow this thinking? Thank you. Excellent question, David. We've always been big believers in diversification here at LGI Super, and Energy Super is just the same. Major investments, of course, in international share markets, but within our infrastructure and, and private capital portfolios in particular, We've always been looking for interesting and differentiated investments in overseas locations. So things like controlled environment foods, for example, the greenhouse strategy in the United States, very different type of return profile to what we can find here in Australia. We're continuing to look for those sorts of investments, but the balance of risk and return opportunities do change over time. There are some quite interesting things happening here in Australia, for example. So we're also big believers in putting money to work 
in the, in the communities where our members are and where they live and work as well. That risk and return balance, that's always the thing that's going to drive us here because we're constantly striving to deliver on those return expectations that members have. Thanks, Troy. A couple of questions I'm going to answer now, which is quite exciting. Uh, so the first question uh, from Richard is, is LGR Super considering a member direct investment option? Um, if you, the question that you're asking there, it, uh, Richard, is, you know, can you create your own portfolio? We already have the capability to do that. You can allocate across the single asset class options uh, that we already have. But if you wanted to do something like that, my best, I suppose, tip for you would be for you to give uh, our advisors a call. Um, and John spoke with you about that earlier and they can discuss how you'd implement the option and what the best sort of structures for you might look like. Another question is from David. I like this one. Dear Kate and Tim, congratulations on your recent efforts. Thank you very much. That's very nice of you. Um, I noticed the comment about demutualise. Is there a time frame? So just to clarify, um, that was actually mutualise and it's mutualised the Suncorp um, superannuation business. So as you know, um, LGR Super and Energy Super are proudly profit for member funds. Uh, we are member owned. Uh, we don't have to pay shareholders and everything that we do goes back to you. Um, with Suncorp, obviously they are a, uh, a retail fund. We are acquiring them through existing reserves that we have. Um, and what will be happening is that that will be repaid effectively by the members of the Suncorp superannuation business. Uh, and then they will be able to own their own fund just as you own your own fund and we can all move in together and generate fantastic benefits for all of you. So it's quite exciting. Thank you for that. Uh, the time frame, by the way, on the mutualisation of Suncorp Super is sort of 2025-ish. So it's a, it's a moderately long-term time frame. There's a lot of work for us to do to make sure that we've harmonised our product structures and the business structures uh, before we get there. Okay, another question for John. What is the minimum draw on super for a 60-year-old? Is it a, per a percentage of super balance? Thanks, Kate. Thanks for the question. Uh, minimum draw, well, it depends on what you do with your super. So I guess, first of all, there's no requirement to move uh, your, your super into a pension account, even if you're retired, so that you do have the option to leave it in an accumulation account, in which case there is no requirement to access it at all. Uh, now, we've already touched on a few reasons tonight why that's often uh, not the best strategy. It, it can certainly be the best strategy, uh, but it's, it's not a requirement. Where you are in a pension account, though, uh, there's, kind of, there's special rules at the moment. So it's up to 65, the standard rule for a minimum you have to take from a pension account is 4%. Now currently, the government has extended uh, a reduction to that. So this financial year, that is reduced to 2% uh, that you need to take. Uh, but the standard rule, and at this stage expected to go back to that in July next year, is um, uh, will go back to 4%. And if you don't mind, Kate, just while I'm on that, a slightly different point, but I, I realise I, I didn't make this point during the presentation, and I'd just like to touch on it then in terms of when to start a pension account. Uh, because we can invest so much money tax-free in retirement, generally, and again, from an advisor perspective, that, that goal is often for us to get it into a, a tax-free pension and at the earliest practical point. But there's one particular reason that I do like to call out where, it's, where, that, where it might not be the best case, and that is where you are dealing with with Centrelink, because I, I mentioned earlier on about a home, someone's home being exempt from, that, from the asset test. Well, then the other most significant situation where you can exempt money uh, from the asset test is if you are not yet your age, pension age, and that money is still in an accumulation account within super. So I could have a million, I could be uh, 60 and retired, and my, my wife could be 67, age, pension age, I could have a million dollars in my account. If I've got, if that's all we've got beside our house and I'm in an accumulation account, she's getting full age pension. So there are some really good uh, government benefit strategies involving that timing of moving into a pension account. Um, but, uh, so sorry for digressing there, but I think that's an important point as well. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, I might actually give you a follow-up question from John again. I like that we've had a Kevin to Kevin and now we've got a John to John. So uh, what is the impact of super balances exceeding 1.7 million? 
Thanks, John. Very good to hear from you. There's not enough of us around these days anymore, unfortunately, but uh, thanks for the question. What's the, and, and sorry, I, I distracted myself a little bit there, excited to get it from a question from a John, but uh, there's, is there a downside? There's no real downside. Uh, I, I touched on briefly, if you're still sort of working and looking at accumulating, if you're at that 1.7 million point, then unfortunately it does shut the door from being able to put additional um, personal money in, so money you might have in the bank or if you've sold uh, investment property or received an uh, in inheritance, then unfortunately the only contributions once you've hit 1.7 are contributions where you're getting a tax deduction such as employer contributions and the like. Um, there's the only other real limit, so let's say if you're at 2 million for example, then the other limitation is that only one, or so if you've never had a pension before, this is as well, uh, 1.7 is the most at which an individual can move into a retirement pension. Um, now that doesn't mean the other 300 has to leave. It does definitely mean you need to consider what the best thing to do with it. But potentially in that scenario, you could move 1.7 million into a tax-free pension and the other 300,000 could continue to be invested in the concessionally taxed accumulation account environment. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good times if you've got more than that. I guess, again, if, there, if you're a couple and you get over that, then you might look for strategies depending on age to be able to, again, uh, maybe move money across from one person to the other so that you can, again, what we'd try and do in most cases for, for couples is how can we make sure that as much of this money as possible is invested in that tax-free pension in the end. Thanks, John. Brilliant. Another question for you, John, from Shane. Uh, Hi, folks. Looking to retire at the comfortable and couple level shown in earlier slides. So do the figures hold true if you're starting from the point of living from the superannuation investments earlier by retiring at 60, realising the figures are calculated on a 20 year lifespan? Yes, uh, Shane. So <laughs> as with every question, I guess the answer is it depends. Uh, now, the, if, if you've got a standard life expectancy or like I said before, if, you, if you're from good stock and genes and you've got the curse of longevity in the family, then no, those numbers won't hold up because as you point out, you, you're most likely funding a, a more than 20 year and it could be more like 30 or 40 years. So uh, as a, you, you should definitely not rely on those numbers as being gospel. They are purely intended as a guide. And what it's going to come down to is, okay, well at 60, and again, your, your spouse's age, if they might be younger than you, then again, if you really need to consider funding for the, the longest life expectancy, which, which would be the, the younger person in, in most cases. Um, so no, don't rely on that number. Again, the best thing you can do is work through. And, and the other factor that comes in, again, we made assumptions that you're a typical mid-range investor with those numbers. Now, if you have a much stronger understanding of investment concepts and you're comfortable with maybe investing a bit more aggressively, well, then you might get a better return and that, that can ease the how much you might need to have. But again, if you're more conservative, then that's gonna push up the amount you need to have as well. So it's, it's a very, the, the real final number is a very individualized thing. And I'm surprised because John didn't put in a plug for advice. Uh, don't forget to, uh, to call our advice team. Uh, if you're concerned about any of these questions, we'd love to discuss them with you. Uh, another question here now for Troy. So Trevor asks, Troy, where do you see the um, Aussie US going in the next 12 months? Thanks, Trevor. The exchange rate is one of those important factors to think about, particularly for our international investments. We've seen the Australian dollar rise from about 55 cents at the bottom of COVID up towards 81 cents. That significant recovery in the global economy and commodity prices in particular. We're exporting record levels of iron ore into China. Twiggy Forest, for example, the chair of Fortescue uh, Minerals, takes home about $1.5 in dividends every year. It's pretty good work if you can get it. We're sitting now at about 72 half cents between the Australian dollar versus the US. And what's the important stuff that happens from here? We're obviously getting a little bit of impact from COVID and the Australian environment at the present time. Interest rates between the US and Australia are also really, really low. So traditionally, interest rates played a much bigger role in the exchange rate changes we see between Australia and the US. I think the outcome over the next year to three years in particular is going to be driven by relative growth outcomes. So if we get a bounce back in the economy and export demand continues to increase and global trade picks up in particular, Australia is well positioned for that. Any recovery in the Chinese economic growth rate in particular, we're going to export more goods and that'll be good for the exchange rate here in particular. 
Thanks, Troy. Question for me uh, from Ray. Uh, when is the 2021 account statement due to be published on the website? Uh, so as part of our annual report, we'll be putting that up uh, at the time that we have our annual members meeting, and that is um, in early November. Uh, another question for John from Brad. In fact, two questions. It starts off saying, sorry, two questions, please. First, the comfortable figures quoted for singles and couples, are they based on you owning your principal place of residence? And two, the asset threshold for couples of 884K. Again, does this exclude your principal place of residence? I was nearly like the footballer running on at home with his mask. Um, two, I'll let you off with two questions, Brad. Uh, comfortable, yes, if I didn't mention that earlier on, I apologise. Yes, definitely those um, as for numbers for comfortable are based on being a, a homeowner. So, yeah, if you were a renter, that could clearly influence that as well. Uh, in terms of the cutoff, absolutely that those sorry those numbers are and we are sending out in, in the workbook you'll get we'll have the non-homeowner numbers but the 884 is based on being a homeowner and that home value is exempt so once again you could have a these days you could have who knows well, three million dollar house um, and that is completely exempt so all they're going to look at but pretty much and I just explained about uh, when super can be exempt but basically Everything else is an asset. So money in the bank. If you've got true valuables, the um, you know the Rembrandt on the wall and, and whatever else, they are all assets. So uh, everything else is given a value. Um, Non-market price things like cars and 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 content. So uh, just looked at sort of fire sale type values, but uh, definitely principal residents uh, exempt. Yep. Thanks very much. One more for you, John uh, from Annette. I'm over 60 and still working full time and paying insurance fees. Am I still covered by insurance? I've been told I'm not covered by insurance after age 60. Is that correct? So great question. Thanks for clarifying it with us. Uh, thanks, Annette. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to say yes or no to that one. Uh, look, the best place to start would be to log into member online. If you've got an insurance, if, it's, if your account is showing that you have an insurance benefit, then yes, you are uh, covered. Possibly where that's coming from uh, is defined benefit members under LGA Super that does uh, typically cease at age 60. So there, there are different categories of membership in the fund. So for some people, their cover might uh, cease at 60, whereas uh, other, other members, it's not till, till 65 typically. So um, yes, the answer is maybe look in your account and if, you, and if you're still unsure, you know, give us a call and we'll certainly be able to clarify that for you. Thanks. Brilliant. We're almost out of time, but I've got one more question for Troy. So, um, asked by Andre, given that Queensland secured the 2032 Olympics, will the fund be investing further in infrastructure? Thank you, Andre. Absolutely. So, you might remember the Commonwealth Games here in Queensland recently, and the accommodation village that was set up on the Gold Coast is now a health precinct. We think there are fantastic opportunities coming down the pipeline between now and 2032 for the Olympics program as well. Transportation, logistics and accommodation solutions in particular. But we're also owning some assets that will benefit from the, the uh, Olympics coming to Queensland. Things like the Sunshine Coast Airport and the Gold Coast Light Rail. We've also got the Cross River Rail program. The, the state government's very keen to roll out co-investment programs associated with that over the next five to seven years. Specific opportunities will come to the fund and we'll make decisions in the best interests of members at the time. But I absolutely think the Olympics will generate not just an exciting time to be in Queensland and be a Queenslander, but investment opportunities for us as well. Team Queensland. So look, thank you so much members and guests for your questions tonight. Um, we've had a lot of great ones. We've done our best to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, but we're now out of time. So if we didn't get to your question tonight, then please rest assured that we will be in contact shortly to answer it uh, where we have your contact details. So we hope that you've enjoyed this evening's presentation. Um, as we said earlier, a recording of the presentation will be available for you on our website uh, over the coming week uh, or thereabouts. At both Energy Super and LGI Super, we have a team of experts who are here to help you. So call us to arrange a time to review your own personal needs and your superannuation strategy. And it'll be people like John who speak with you. 
There will be slides following the webinar this evening with information you may find useful on how we can help you with your superannuation needs. Thanks so much for joining us tonight and I hope you have a marvellous